Hello, uh, this is Dr. Laced, and today I want to talk about Susan Glassbell's short play, Trifles. Plays are a unique mode of storytelling. A play has some elements in common with a written narrative. It usually has a plot, characters, and a setting. And it has something in common with a movie. It is designed to be watched rather than read. But a play also has qualities that are uniquely its own. Written stories and movies both are capable of creating detailed worlds of physical objects to exist alongside their characters. A prose writer or a film director can represent a sunset or a shoe just as vividly as she can represent a human being. In a play, however, the characters are everything. It is true that most plays contain set descriptions and significant props, but the physical world in a play is primarily a stage for the characters to express themselves and live out their lives. Dramatic art is the most human-centered of the literary genres. Perhaps it is for this reason that the greatest creative writer who ever lived, William Shakespeare, was particularly attracted to the art of playwriting. Because it focuses so closely on human beings and their interactions with one another, a play is a representation of society in miniature. In the same way that society is made up of many different people, all of whom possess their own point of view, the plot of a play is generally propelled by the ways that different characters perceive the world around them in ways that are uniquely their own. All of the characters in a play inhabit the same setting, whether it's an ancient Greek city-state, a medieval castle, or an American farmhouse, but the characters distinguish themselves from one another by the different ways they perceive this shared world. In Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, the two lovers find something that is worth living and dying for that almost seems to put them in another universe than the one inhabited by the surrounding adults, even though they all share the same stage. In Shakespeare's Hamlet, the title character is separated from everyone else by his perception of the cruelty, corruption, and vanity that he sees around him. The theme of perception is always very prominent in any play. In her famous short play, Trifles, Susan Glassbell takes up this dramatic preoccupation with perception and relates it specifically to the issue of gender. Glassbell structures her play around a typical narrative genre, the murder mystery, which is also a style of storytelling that accentuates the theme of perception. The detective investigating a murder mystery is an archetypal perceiver, examining the physical objects and other people around him in the attempt to solve the murder and identify the truth. Throughout Trifles, the characters spend their time looking around the right house, attempting to read the clues of what happened. They know that Mr. Hale discovered Minnie Wright acting psycho in a rocking chair while her husband lay dead upstairs, strangled in a most peculiar way while lying in bed, but the events leading up to this moment are known only to Mr. and Mrs. Wright. He can't tell what happened because he's dead, and she can't or won't tell what happened because she seems to have dropped out of the human perceptual order altogether. Her state of mind, is she crazy with grief or with murderous glee, is itself part of the mystery. When a murder is committed, society has a ready response. In Trifles, the 1916 version of the CSI team shows up to scour the scene for forensic evidence and the gears of justice are set in motion. The county attorney, the sheriff, and Mr. Hale occupy the first five or ten minutes of the play talking amongst themselves, verifying the details of Mr. Hale's account, and examining the downstairs area of the house. The county attorney takes notes in a notebook. He listens to Mr. Hale's account according to procedural rules for witness questioning and considers his account in terms of its legal ramifications. It is clearly an interview rather than a conversation. The county attorney is like Friday, the cop in an old TV show famous for the down-to-business admonition, just the facts, ma'am. His model of how to arrive at truth is the one used in geometry or scientific inquiry. An objective and dispassionate accumulation of facts will eventually build up to a big picture. That's the same thing that Sherlock Holmes does, that the CSI team does, and that we expect from a murder mystery narrative. So, so far, Glassbell seems to be giving us a straightforwardly generic detective story. The play takes an interesting turn, however, due to the presence of Mrs. Peters, who is the sheriff's wife, and Mrs. Hale. Throughout the men's discussion, they both stand by the door, declining to move closer to the stove, even though it is very cold in the farmhouse. The arrangement of the characters on the stage, with the spatial separation of the men and the women, emphasizes a more fundamental kind of separation between them that the play will go on to explore. The men stand around the stove in masculine camaraderie, treating the house as if it were an extension of the courthouse. The women are exiled off in the corner, while the men go about their important business, confident in their professional skills. 
even before the play explicitly begins to dramatize the specific conflict between the women's way of seeing and the men's way of seeing, the presence of the women on the left-hand side of the stage introduces another possible perspective on the situation the men are discussing. The men's legal procedure, which we accept as natural, may actually be only one style of approaching the mystery at the heart of the story, and perhaps not a particularly effective style at that. The correspondence between the spatial separation of the men and the women and the separation between the ways they each perceive their surroundings becomes explicit when the attorney and the sheriff agree that there is nothing important in the kitchen. They seem to arrive at this opinion not due to any physical search they have done of the kitchen, but entirely because of their gender prejudices. As the area of the house associated with women and their domestic tasks, the entire kitchen is below the radar of the menfolk. When Mrs. Peters expresses sympathy for Minnie Wright over the subject of her ruined preserves, she is mocked by the sheriff, whose reaction clearly emphasizes the theme of differing styles of perception. Held for murder and worrying about her preserves. To the male characters, their legal questions are of exclusive priority, but Mrs. Peters and Mrs. Hale both know how much labor goes into preserving fruits, and they relate to the ordinary accomplishments and frustrations that constitute the daily fabric of life for a rural housewife in the early 1900s. Rather than acknowledging, empathizing with, and possibly learning from the women's perspective, however, Hale dismisses their concern in the line that gives the play its name, Women are used to worrying over trifles, while the county attorney responds in a way that is arguably even more dismissive of the women's point of view. And yet, for all their worries, what would we do without the ladies? All three of the men express different types of contempt, both for the women themselves and for the objects and spaces that they associate with women. While both Mrs. Hale and Mrs. Peters hang back from the men at the beginning of the play, Mrs. Hale begins to assert herself as a proto-feminist when she objects to the sexist judgments the men express about the state of Minnie Wright's kitchen, in which they can perceive only the signs of a negligent housewife. But when the attorney blames Minnie for her dirty towels, Mrs. Hale suggests that the real culprit is men's dirty hands, and later speculates that they might have been dirtied up by a policeman who had stopped by earlier. When the attorney impugns Minnie Wright's femininity by concluding that she must not have had the homemaking instinct, Mrs. Hale observes, well, I don't know as Wright had either, insinuating not only that Minnie's husband was not an easy man to live with, but also that women and men share responsibility for the mood of the, their domestic environment. After the men leave, Mrs. Hale's disposition to stand up for Minnie takes a darker tone when Mrs. Peters repeats the men's accusation that it seems unlikely that Minnie could sleep soundly while her husband was being strangled in the bed right next to her. Well, Mrs. Hale responds, I guess John Wright didn't wake up when they was slipping that rope around his neck. When the women are left alone in the kitchen with the task of gathering some clothes to take to Minnie in the jail cell, they begin to come across a series of clues that indicate why and how Minnie killed her husband. They do not do so by pursuing a procedural investigation, but by simply talking to one another in a natural way, and not by systematically searching through Minnie's things, but by expressing their sympathy and concern for the household objects that are a kind of extension of Minnie's identity. When the menfolk upstairs are trying to get her own house to turn against her, their footsteps a constant reminder of the lofty ideals of justice and science which the men stand for, the women enter into a kind of dialogue with Minnie, who, although absent, is able to speak through the coded meanings she has left behind in the things she loved. Coming across an unfinished quilt, the women speculate as to what style of stitching Minnie was going to use, quilting or knotting. The men laugh, the stage direction tells us. The quilt is one of those inconsequential trifles that women are always fiddling with. But as Mrs. Hale and Mrs. Peters continue to examine the quilt, they discover some irregular stitching that seems to suggest Minnie's agitated mind. It is as if Minnie had left a confession written in her sewing that could only be read by someone who was intimately familiar with the language of sewing. The women then come upon a birdcage with a broken door, a discovery which causes Mrs. Hale to comment on her own memories of Minnie, a next-door neighbor whom she hardly ever sees. She used to sing real pretty herself, Mrs. Hale tells Mrs. Peters, and even that she was kind of like a bird herself. 
the final discovery of a canary with a twisted neck hidden away in Minnie's sewing box, a place the men would never consider worth noticing, completes the picture of a brutal incident of male violence against a small animal that is clearly a slightly displaced display of violence against Minnie herself. Together, these clues weave a story about a lovely and carefree young woman whose spirit was crushed by a marriage to a brutal and tyrannical husband. We know about John Wright that he refused to go in with his neighbors on a collective telephone line. His house is in a small valley which cuts it, cuts it off from the rest of the neighborhood. Mrs. Peters says that the social consensus on John Wright is that he was a good man. But this comment only serves to illustrate that these characters live in a world that has defined goodness in such a way he didn't drink and kept his word as well as most, I guess, and paid his debts, that a man can be considered good even if he is a complete jerk. From all of these clues, Mrs. Hale and Mrs. Peters arrive at an unspoken reconstruction of events in which John's murder of the canary, whose singing Mr. Wright must have detested, was the last straw for Mrs. Wright, who, driven to the brink of madness, killed her husband in a way that both parallels the strangulation of her pet bird and also demonstrates her impressive skill with knots. But in learning to see the murder mystery from the women's point of view, we gain more than simply insight into the truth of who murdered John Wright. We also gain access to new ways of thinking about the more fundamental questions of motivation, responsibility, and justice. If the men knew what Mr. Mrs. Hale and Mrs. Peters know, they would be able to clearly establish Mrs. Wright's guilt. But from the women's perspective, Minnie appears to be less the perpetrator of a crime and more like the victim. While Mr. Wright may have suffered for a minute or two while he was being strangled, Minnie has clearly endured decades of oppression and abuse at the hands of her surly husband. Murdering her husband is the accomplishment of her own kind of justice, a justice claimed on her own terms, with her own tools, outside of the masculine justice system, which, especially in 1916, does not recognize domestic abuse as a legally punishable offense, for the same reason that the attorney and the sheriff pay no attention to the clues in the kitchen. Furthermore, due to his own responsibility in turning Minnie from a sweet and pretty choir girl into a murderer, Wright can be said to be responsible for his own murder and to be the recipient of his own just deserts. Similarly, while the masculine system of justice would have no problem convicting Minnie of the murder and closing the book on the Wright case, Mrs. Hale's perception of justice and responsibility is more complicated. Rather than isolating either Minnie or John as the sole guilty party, Mrs. Hale considers her own guilt in not being a better neighbor to Minnie Wright. Perhaps if she had been less preoccupied with her own concerns and been more thoughtful of her neighbor's welfare, she might have been able to alleviate Minnie's isolation. I wish I'd come over here once in a while. That was a crime. That was a crime. Who's going to punish that? While the masculine system of jurisprudence matches crimes and victims up in a very direct mathematical way, Mrs. Hale recognizes that it takes a village to commit a crime, that there is a kind of guilt that exists beyond the law, making us all responsible for the sadness, loneliness, and violence that we allow to exist in our own communities. The men's legal perspective keeps them from being able to recognize Mrs. Hale's perspective on guilt, their way of seeing is also a way of not seeing the complicated truths of human interdependency. Finally, of course, the men are unable to solve the crime at all, exiting the farmhouse just as baffled as they were when they came in. Mrs. Hale and Mrs. Peters, rather than sharing their discovery with the menfolk and providing them with the motive they need to wrap up the case, engage in a conspiracy to hide the evidence. They are easily able to get away with doing so because it is unfathomable to the men that the women would have any independent thoughts or relevant information. In concealing the dead bird and telling the lie that the canary was killed by a cat, the women institute their own style of justice based on their own perception of Minnie's situation in direct revolt against their husbands. In doing so, Mrs. Hale and Mrs. Peters form a sisterhood with Minnie Wright, claiming solidarity on the basis of their shared experiences as wives in a sexist society. We live close together, Mrs. Hale observes, and we live far apart. We go through the same things. It's all just a different kind of the same thing. Their marriages may not be as dysfunctional as Minnie and John Wright's, 
but they are all in the position of going unseen as individuals by their husbands, their perspectives and points of view being silenced by dismissive menfolk in the same fundamental way, if not to the same extent, as Minnie was silenced by John. In hiding the dead canary, Mrs. Hale and Mrs. Peters turn their silence and their social invisibility into a weapon against their husbands and against the entire system of masculine authority in the same way that Minnie turned her quilting expertise into a weapon. By the end of the play, Mrs. Peters discovers that she is not as married to the law as the attorney confidently assumes she is. Toward the beginning of the play, she defended the masculine system of justice, mouthing the weak platitude, the law's the law. By the end of the short play, however, her perspective, along with the audience's, has undergone a revolution by conceptualizing a style of justice and inquiry rooted in principles of empathy, shared responsibility, and the validity of alternate perspectives.